Hey everybody, I'm Jammer here today with my video review for The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild for Nintendo Switch. For my background with the series, I am a huge Zelda fan. Many of the 3D titles are among my favorite games of all time. Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, Majora's Mask, you name it. I've played and replayed every entry numerous times at this point. When it comes to Breath of the Wild, everything we've known to expect from those past games were put aside. The goal of this game was to break the series conventions and truly make a fresh new experience. This would be the series' first jump into open world, and right off the bat, I have to say they did a great job. Almost anywhere you can see, you can go. Whether it's the mountain in the far off distance, or the Bokoblin camp you just barely spotted hidden in the cliffside. This felt like a real living and breathing world. When it comes to open world games, sometimes they feel like they're just big for the sake of being big. Thus, the player ends up traveling just where they need to go, like point A to point B. Breath of the Wild is unlike that, where the player is encouraged to explore and find things for themselves. Even trying to traverse this world feels realistic. Environmental factors like heat and cold affect Link, where he'll need to drink refreshments to keep cool or bundle up to stay warm. Heck, if you equip a flame sword, that'll even keep you warm in cold areas. It'll even melt snowballs as you carry them. As a real human would, Link cannot climb, swim, or sprint endlessly due to a stamina meter. This adds to the immersion that makes Link seem just as vulnerable as we are. Some of these things I would have never thought about in the context of a game because they've never been implemented in this way before. I spent countless hours just exploring Hyrule and not focusing on any sort of quest. I usually don't care about that stuff, yet I found myself constantly wanting to know what was hidden on the other side of the next hill, because every valley and every mountain would be hiding something. This is truly a compliment when coming from other open world games where I would just stick to the roads to get to my destination. There was always something to do, something to find, and I was happily distracted. Your reward for exploration can be many things. You could run across a shrine, which are essentially mini dungeons with self-contained puzzles with the reward of a spirit orb. You can later trade those in for a new heart or stanima container. This helps pace out the game because the more you collect, the easier the game will end up being because you'll have more health so you can last longer in battle or more stamina so you can climb, run, and swim farther than before. Even though the shrines all look similar aesthetically, I really enjoyed how diverse each shrine could be. They all had a focus on some sort of puzzle that involves something with the game's physics. You then would use your toolbox of runes that you start the game with to see which would work in your given situation. I thought that this was an awesome way to start the game. Have the Great Plateau as a tutorial area where you can get all the tools you will need for the rest of your playthrough. Some were more useful than others, but each served their purpose by helping you solve puzzles and traverse the world. Since the release, players have been experimenting with these tools and the game's physics to make some crazy combinations, like using magnesis to push a metal treasure chest to into the mast of your boat to speed along a river. We're only going to discover more as the game continues to grow. Another reward for exploring are Korok Seeds. These little guys are scattered throughout the overworld. Whenever you see something suspicious, or something that looks like it has an intentional design, it's safe to bet that one of these guys is hiding there. Sometimes, the puzzles are as simple as lifting a rock. Other times, it's much more elaborate where you have to roll a rock down a hill into a hole, do a little shooting gallery minigame with your bow, or use something as sneaky as an acorn hidden at the end of a log. Even the shrines sometimes have these physics-based puzzles just to enter them, like riding a log across a freezing river or to push a snowball down a hill to open a door. There's nearly a countless amount of puzzles like these, and the reward for the completion is, well, a Korok seed. At first, these seem kind of pointless. However, you can use these seeds later to upgrade your inventory, which is essential in this game. Breath of the Wild introduces a weapon degrading system where each weapon, shield, and bow has a set durability. Once it runs out, the weapon will destroy and be gone for good. I actually rather enjoy this because instead I'm always worried about saving my powerful stuff for later, I just used it. Especially since you can upgrade your inventory so you can build a pretty large arsenal for Link to use. I can see why this system can be a little controversial since at the beginning of the game you feel like you're constantly bleeding through weapons and equipment. But I really enjoyed it because it gave another purpose to exploration. If you were in need for some new equipment, maybe it was time to search out a Bokoblin camp and raid them for any new weapons. I think the durability system works well in this game's favor, however I can see the complaint against it. Another new thing introduced in Breath of the Wild is a formal quest log. In past Zeldas there was both side and main stories, but they've never been as formal as they are in this game. I feel the transition to this structure worked really well. With the amount of people you meet in your adventure, it really helped for convenience and it made the game feel much more modern. 
The side quests themselves serve many purposes, interact more with the game's characters, lead you to new areas or shrines, and even encourage you to explore more. How the game is set up, you can completely ignore these if you really wanted. If you just want to go off, explore, without anyone giving you suggestions on what to do, you absolutely can. There is no limit on the freedom to this game. Now let's get to the real meat being the story and dungeons. Typically these are the strong points of past Zelda games, but I felt that they were some of the weaker aspects of this game. Don't get me wrong, they're still good. It's just what they're put up against everything else that the game has to offer. They tend to lean on the lower end of things. The dungeon puzzles were challenging, and I haven't been stumped like that in a long time. What was interesting that each dungeon had a gimmick where you could drastically change the layout of the dungeons to help you solve puzzles and progress. It was awesome at first, however, by the fourth dungeon it started to get a little dull. Either that or the game had trained me to solve these types of puzzles with shrines and such, maybe I'd just gotten better at solving them. Again, aesthetically, all the dungeons were nearly identical. They kind of had their own identity since they were loosely based on the element of the area like fire or water, but once you were inside, they were all very... samey. I kind of miss the true dungeon theming of past Zelda games. I think the biggest reason why they felt so similar was because they all had the same goal. You had to get linked to a specific control point in order to activate them. It was always different in the way you got to each one, but again, it was still the same end goal. But the bosses were challenging, yet since they were so similar, by the end I felt they weren't that difficult. Even the final boss feels a little bit easier than he should be. And without getting into any spoilers, the cutscenes within each dungeon would literally repeat lines. I understand it had to be that way since you can do any of the dungeons in any order, so any of them could be the players first. That's great for the freedom of the game, so it was a challenge to have it all make sense. The setup or build up before the dungeons was typically my favorite part of Zelda games. In Breath of the Wild, they're good, but a little short. Some of them were pretty memorable, except when you compare them to some of the past Zelda games, I think they might have the upper hand. Again, it could be just because you're able to do these in any order, so there's no way to have one link into the next. There was one dungeon that I won't name, but it was just plain bad. The build up was literally as simple as talking to one person and then boom, you're already heading to the dungeon. And that dungeon was the easiest one in this game. I honestly think I beat that entire area within 40 minutes. This was probably the lowest part of the game for me. Now, let's talk about story. Again, there will be no spoilers as I will talk about everything in a general sense. Like I mentioned previously, you could tackle the dungeon in any order or even do the build up for multiple at the same time. This truly mirrors the absolute freedom of the game and is also the biggest challenge to the storytelling and dungeon designs. They couldn't make each dungeon progressively harder than the last because any dungeon could be the player's first. Because of this, it posed a challenge to tell a chronological story. It wasn't amazing, however I still think they did a good enough job of what they had to work with. Another series first is the inclusion of voice acting. I'm never really picky when it comes to voice acting, but I felt that this performance was a little shaky. It honestly wasn't the actor's fault, it felt like more the script had some awkward dialogue. For example, when you first meet a character, their words just don't feel organic as they would in a normal conversation. Paraphrasing of course, they'd be like, uh, oh, my name's blah 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 and I'm the best dang soldier in the village. It just didn't make sense for them to say that. It felt like they were explaining themselves like reading a bio or something. Not all the voice acting was like this, although there were many instances similar. Finally, let's talk about the music. It was pretty good, but it's very minimalistic, especially the overworld. In past Zeldas, you'd have a constant theme playing where in Breath of the Wild, it would only play on occasion. This actually worked to the game's benefit since the majority of your playtime will be spent in the overworld, a looping theme would get annoying after a while. Unless it's the Great Sea theme, of course. So when the music did come on, it felt pretty special. I would always take a second to bask in the vistas of this world. The towns and special landmarks all had music specifically for those areas. They were all pretty good themes, and some were even remixes of the original tunes for that area in past games, which was an awesome little easter egg. Even so, I found this game's soundtrack not as strong as some of the past games. It's not that it was bad, like the main theme for Breath of the Wild is awesome. I just feel like it's not as consistent. It could be because you don't hear the songs as much as you do in past games, but if this game did have constant music, I think it would be to its detriment. The ambient sounds of wind and birds was very soothing and again much more immersive. Overall, Breath of the Wild is truly an amazing game. It nearly redefines the open world genre giving a true purpose to exploration. Nearly every mountain, forest, and valley conceals something, and I've never been so compelled to discover all that this world is hiding. This game starts with a simple toolbox and you use these tools to solve endless puzzles throughout the world. The shrines give an excellent taste of puzzles for you to solve and they never overstay their welcome. 
With nearly countless quests to complete and places to explore, this game feels like it will never end. Even with all that, not everything is perfect. It's not that the dungeons were bad or the voice acting was poor. I think it's when it's put up to comparison against all the rest that the game has to offer that they're overshadowed. The game's absolute freedom makes it difficult to tell a good story, but they still did a good enough job for what they had to work with. It's just that everything else in the game is so amazing that it makes these aspects seem much more worse than they really are. Even with all that in consideration, I am still obsessed with The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I have not forfeited this much sleep for one game since I was a kid. I truly cannot put it down because it is that good. I beat the game with a merely 22% completion rate, and that's pitiful in comparison to other games. Nevertheless, that just adds to my excitement of how much there still is left for me in this game to experience. This game is unlike any Zelda or any open world game before it. Nintendo has set the bar of quality to a new high. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to give this video a big awesome like, and if you haven't already, subscribe for tons more on Breath of the Wild, video game reviews, and other Nintendo related content, as well as covers for the planned DLC for this game later this year. Quick shout out to Nick for always editing the scripts for these reviews. You're awesome! <laughs> Anyways, thank you again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya!